Can everyone hear me? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In a roundabout way, Eric is very right. We didn't know a huge amount of information about this topic before 15 minutes ago, and it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to access that information. And the reason for that is precisely because <laughs> newspapers continue to have their intellectual property stolen and reproduced for free elsewhere. They continue to go broke around the nations, and they continue to be unable to provide the valuable information that makes the public discourse possible, that makes the very functioning of democracy something that can be achieved. And ever since the days of W.T. Stead, despite his unquestionable methods at the Paul Moore Gazette, it has been investigative journalism in print media that is essential to the proper continuation of that discourse, and we think that that is something that is deeply under threat in today's debate, and we're very proud to stand behind this proposal. So our proposal is relatively simple. It has basically three steps. One, that the way in which these editorial boards or that the subsidy would be operated would be by independent bodies in the same way that we operate bodies for public broadcasters like the ABC or the BBC, or in the, or the same way we operate funding for political elections that are publicly administrated. We don't think those appointments are up deep, totally depoliticised, but we think it's something we can manage. No, thank you. Second thing, we're going to make it so that there's a, basically one to two major papers in each big city. Uh, we, we we're applying this proposal across Western liberal democracies, maybe three or four, I don't really mind. But we're going to make sure that there is a market for newspapers in those cities, and we're going to oblige them not to implement paywalls on their websites or to price gouge. Uh, so, I'm going to present a couple of things in this speech. First, I'm going to look at why it's the legitimate role of the state to have an interest in and a stake in, even financially, and I'll get to in a moment, uh, the, the, the publication of newspapers. And secondly, I'm going to look at why subsidies precisely are the solution that's necessary to rectify the problems that are, that are occurring in the journalism industry today. Would you fund a paper set up and run by Rush Limbaugh? And if not, what are your criteria for deciding who to fund? Um, that seems like something we'd do. Um, and, but we think that uh, Rush Limbaugh couldn't run a paper on his own. And the effect would be that there would be an editorial board, and that an editorial board would publish a paper, and as most papers do, they would publish a diversity of opinions. We think that's something we're happy to do, whether that those opinions are better out in the open and aired, and, the, and that if those didn't, didn't need the subsidy, then they, we wouldn't get the subsidy if they could survive on their own. Okay, so why is this in the legitimate role of the state? The first is that newspapers generate more benefits than are factored into the price and those benefits extend to people beyond those who directly consume newspapers. The kind of thing that investigative journalism and that print broadcasters do has a public benefit which we think the state has an interest in maintaining. So just as we expect that in order for voters to have proper informed choice, they need access to information, they need access to the political candidates that can communicate that information to them, we would allow the public funding of those candidates to communicate that information to them. We think the fourth estate has a particularly important role in communicating information separate from what those candidates say, and that that is particularly under threat, as I'm going to get to in my second argument, Will. Before the circulation of the sun collapsed in Great Britain, the editor used to have weekly meetings with every single British Prime Minister. Was that good or bad for British democracy? Uh, I think that was good for British democracy, because he could write about what those meetings happened, and maybe he didn't do that. But in those circumstances, we think that those ideas are better adjudicated by those individuals, and that when people reapply for editorial board positions, that's something that we can, uh, we can adjudicate on at the point where that occurs. We don't think that's a necessary product of the subsidy system. So, so why is it that the public discourse is not, is not factored in under the status quo? The first reason is because, at the moment, the commercial incentives for information distri distribution don't align with the democratic incentives. So the kinds of things, and Paul's going to talk more about this substantively in his speech, that public pu papers are likely to publish in order to, to maintain circulation to be profitable, continues to not contribute the kind of information that we need for that democracy to function. But also that those incentives are unlikely to ever align. The second is that the market can't, can, can't sustain itself because, although not technically stolen or not technically uh, 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 you know, you, you're allowed to quote people, That's, we're not banning that. The, the fact is that at the moment, people free ride off the work of investigative journalism in a way that, 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 that means that those papers can never collect payment on that. So, so when blogs reproduce the kind of work that journalists do on the ground and quote them, that those papers aren't able to re re recoup those costs and survive on the basis of their circulation alone. That also affects their advertising revenues because it means that people aren't, aren't going to put up the advertising if that's not the source that people go to. We think more people are likely to read these newspapers under our proposal. No, thank you. We think there are other reasons why that has occurred, and, and we're, we're happy to accept that these aren't bad things, 
but they're things we have to acknowledge by the by. So things like eBay replacing the trading post means that those, that those revenues are never likely to, to increase again, and they're never likely to be re to uh, occur in a way that is beneficial towards the dissemination of information for public discourse. The third reason why this is a legitimate role of the state is that the, pe the publication industry is increasingly monopolistic as a result of those previous two reasons, that it becomes almost impossible for people to sustain papers unless they come from an enormous media empire, and that narrows the amount of information that individuals have available to them when they make choices in elections. No thanks. Second question, why is it that the unique work of uh, print investigative journalism or print journalism in newspaper form needs subsidies and, not, and why the rest of the media won't do or why there isn't another solution? We think there are a series of things that, that, that newspapers, no thank you Michael, possess that other forms of journalism never will and never can. So the first thing that they do is they absorb a whole lot of costs that we don't think that independent or small, small, small firms or bloggers can ever absorb. So the kind of fees for freedom of information requests, basic fact-checking resources, legal costs if you're breaking a controversial story and potentially defaming someone, the kinds of things that make running a newspaper incredibly expensive. No, thank you. We think it's that they, they employ people who analyse and analyse content instead of just producing that content. So it's an important role to have people who are writing op-eds and not just generating those news off the wires of AAP and Reuters, but it's an incentive to continue to publish those news by using that information that's easily available and, and, and cheaply available rather than information that contributes to that debate. We think there are a few specific issues upon which newspapers especially place to have an important comment in this debate. We think in things like war reporting, that there, is, there are reasons and structural reasons why a random blogger can't put themselves on the ground uh, in Libya uh, unless they're like Tom Lee. That's a very specific joke for like three people in the room, so that was stupid. Um, uh, that, that, uh, that in those circumstances, that though that reporting would never occur. The discourse that comes from that on blogs afterwards would never occur if we didn't have the people on the ground to, to cover those stories in the first place. And the kind of visceral reactions people have if that comes off the TV rather than the newspapers is something that we think we could prevent. Finally, I just want to briefly touch on this question of independence and whether we think that these papers can be successfully independent. We think in many circumstances, papers, that, uh, papers or journalism industries that receive public funding do and regularly are independent from the states that, that provide those funds. So the ABC is a great example in Australia, the BBC in the UK. The way in which the application process for those work means that there are regular critiques of the government on those stations. There are also things that applaud the government, and we think that we're quite happy to stand by that. We think the process by which we're editors are reappointed uh, is an actual incentive for those papers not to go absolutely cray. So for all of those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, we're very proud to propose. I thank that speaker for his remarks, and this House is now very pleased to recognize the Leader of the Opposition. from the government is a case motivated entirely by some kind of crazy love affair with news printed on dead trees. We stand for the future. We stand for a news media that involves partly large corporations printing broadsheets, but partly things like blogs, things like, I don't know, leaks organizations, like WikiLeaks and OpenLeaks, partly by things like professionals writing on their fields of expertise on the internet, as in, is increasingly happening in a whole range of academic disciplines. What we say is the government shouldn't pick winners. The government shouldn't pick one particular form of media and say, this is such a good form of media that we're going to subsidize it over all the other forms of media out there, including the ones that wouldn't be feasible to subsidize in any particular world anyway. So what do we hear from what do we hear from them? First, first we were told, well, we're going to subsidise one to two major papers in each big city, and then they'll stop. I mean, that seems an awful lot like entrenching a corporate hierarchy and a local monopoly over the news, producing exactly all the bad things that they want. Or maybe they won't stop. In which case, will every xenophobic bigot get to publish all the hate speech they like with government funding? I'd like to know. And if not. What criteria are they going to choose on the basis of? Because it's not good enough that the board is politically independent from the existing government. They could be making all kinds of arbitrary choices based on their own political preferences, based on their own desire to shape the rest of the democracy according to what they think the voters should hear. And inevitably, their policy is going to involve questions about who runs that one big newspaper. Shame. Who runs that newspaper in your major city? And frequently, the answer is going to be people like Rupert Murdoch, because they're already well-placed with the staff to do it. That's not helping corporate hegemony. And they say there's a democratic externality from papers. There's a democratic externality from the news media. And we say, 
Most of these holes, we think that new media can provide, and I'm going to explain how in my speech. But lastly, they say this most ridiculous point about free riding, no oh, thank you, right. and the good work that newspapers do. To which we say, well, if this is literal free riding, right, lifting and copying editorial work or literal news articles, we're happy with enforcing copyright law. But let's be charitable. Let's assume the claim is maybe you're copying information and that's bad. Well, we put to you that the free riding in recent months on most major stories has been going the other direction. WikiLeaks discovers all the things the American government is up to and then lets the news media, the, you know, the print media they so love, free ride on it, right? Like, you know, the Arab Spring, massively most of the footage we got was from amateurs with video cameras which they uploaded to the internet, which all the organizations which they think are the victims of free riding then free rode on and published. It's just not clear that this is something that they are damaged by rather than something, you no know, thank you, that they benefit from. So let's, so let's get to this. I'm going to make two main claims in my speech. The first is that their move of backing this particular form of media is going to stifle the growth of a genuinely better way of having the media industry. The second is that it is going to actually damage print journalism itself. So let's start. We put to you that increasingly new media is becoming more and more capable. And this isn't just like a random person writing on their blog, right? These are not-for-profit organizations helping government whistleblowers get their stories to the world, right? Frequently, these are more effective at getting government, whistleblower, uh, government whistleblowers to come forward than organizations which are funded at whatever degree of remove from the government. Frequently, if they're considered as investigative journalism, this is being provided by exactly these kinds of bodies, right? Like WikiLeaks, like OpenLeaks, like EuroLeaks, which, you know, have all kinds of things they release in the public domain, yes. Who do you think put the information that WikiLeaks may have discovered into a form that was useful for advancing democratic debate? I, I, mean, I, 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 I don't know about you, but it looks like a print media which we didn't need to fund, right? Like it's places like The Guardian which don't receive a government subsidy, along with, I don't know, lots of people on the internet who then combs through these sources, put them up in blogs saying, did you know the US government has a little transcript from the year 1997 where it did this little bit of skullduggery? Like, these are all important. It's not clear to me why we needed to fund the broadcast media in order to get them to publish WikiLeaks stuff. Furthermore, we put to you that, like, in many cases, there were worries about lack of high-quality editorial work. Frequently, professionals are now going past the middlemen and directly addressing the public. Look at economists, Nobel Prize winners like Paul Krugman, people like Greg Mankiw, producing an unprecedented degree of high quality economic journalism on available on blogs. Look at people like Pam Carlin, who is a constitutional law scholar at Stanford, also massively useful high quality editorial work, bypassing this usual sure. framework where the middleman decides who you're going to listen to. No, thank you. We put you that their policy, by favoring this one form of news media and implying that it's just much more legitimate than the other forms, gives an unfair edge to a form of news media that is less participatory, less openly democratic, involves more people filtering both the sort of vague board and the editorial committees of these papers, what the public yeah. sees, all in ways that are massively damaging. Closing. So, Shang, this is a comparative debate. Why is it better to have Rupert Murdoch picking winners and losers than it is to have a independent Well, your policy looks like a lot like it would fund Rupert Murdoch. So it's not clear to me how that would help. But furthermore, even if that's the question, my point is simply that making, giving one particular player in a marketplace a cost advantage that lets them encroach on the spaces of the other players helps drive those other players away. No, thank you. Makes it less likely, for instance, that Greg Mankiw is able to do his blog on his own rather than having, I don't know, him being recruited by the New York Times on the subsidy, right? This, this means that scarce editorial and journalistic resources are bought up by the print media sector, which might otherwise go elsewhere in a way that's far more participatory and democratic. But most damagingly, their case damages the very quality of print media itself. Why? Because it creates fairly obvious conflicts of interest, even if not with the government directly, with this independent review board selected by people who will still be human beings with political leanings that they may feel they need to ingratiate themselves to. If they do openly criticize the government, perhaps the government may not, I don't know, like, uh, ban them directly, but maybe it will cut the amount of funding that it gives the review board to distribute. But most damagingly, if they're going to have a political te politically tenable policy of funding news organizations, presumably the review board will involve various kinds of ethical checks on what these organizations do. That means they're going to need to pour through the files of what these broadsheets are going to publish. Look at things like, I don't know, the informants they come to them and their identities. 
Now, firstly, this is going to make it much harder for them to keep these sources secret. But even if that's not true, the very perception that there is careful and clear government oversight over what's being said means that many actors who feel alienated from the establishment are much more afraid to come forward to broadsheets and tell their stories. This damages the quality of broadsheet journalism and erodes trust in that. Now, we're not saying we want broadsheets to disappear overnight. We think that they are a useful part of a media ecosystem. But it's a media ecosystem where increasingly the things they think are necessary for democracy have been taken over by other new forms of media, forms which we should not subsidize against, as their policy suggests. We stand for a new dawn in what media stands for. We're proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for those remarks. And this house is now very pleased to recognize the deputy prime minister. Here, here. Well, it's great that there are some scholars and that there are some not-for-profit agencies that are happy to give information and news away for free. That's great, but that's really not going to change under either side in this debate. What is going to change is under this uh, their system where you just rely on market logic uh, to, ga to guarantee information is that the oldest, most respected newspapers that have uh, that have a track record of like hard analysis rather than just like throwing information out into the public domain will die, and then the quality of public debate will go with it. Let's look at three issues. In, uh, in rebuttal. Firstly, the, the attacks that this wasn't necessary. Secondly, about who would be running these papers. And thirdly, uh, other material about politicisation. So firstly, on the material we were told about why it's not necessary. He said, oh, free writing can be fixed with, uh, with copyright law. You know, we, we would say that they're copying facts, not expression, and that that is enough to take away the comparative advantage of papers and make them not profitable, and then those facts don't get out. Then he told us, oh, but actually WikiLeaks is releasing more information and doing more investigation than the newspapers are. Look, we think that the newspapers have cut back on all their investigative journalism and they would be breaking more stories if their business model were still profitable, which is what Don told you. But the, the incentives of WikiLeaks you know, are quite benevolent. They're not for profit. They're going to be doing that under either case uh, in this model. But what I told you in a point of information was that WikiLeaks can only just dump information into the public domain. But who employed the people that read the thousands of cables of WikiLeaks and sifted out the most important stories to democratic decisions like whether or not we invaded Iraq? That was big, that was papers like the Wall Street Journal that churned through that, that, take, that took information and made an analysis, the basis of which improved people's democratic choice. Shane said, well, the Wall Street Journal can just take that information off WikiLeaks and do it anyway. Well, the Wall Street Journal won't exist, or if the, you know, the biggest paper in the world will still exist, others won't, and that will be a harm that we've already pointed to in this debate. Lastly on this, we heard scholars will give it away for free. Look, that will happen under either case, but are professional columnists going to give it away for free? Are people whose job it is to think deeply about the political issues and make political arguments in the public space going to give it away for free? No, they're not. Second thing I want to look at in rebuttal is who this is going to be given to. And we heard this will entrench a corporate monopoly. Look, we're not just going to fund the biggest newspaper or just going to fund Rupert Murdoch. We're going to fund lots of papers. So we don't think that that monopoly is going to happen. Second of all, there is no harm to like this shutting out all the amazing insurgent newspapers because there are no insurgent newspapers. This debate takes place in a context where newspapers are dying. So we don't think that that is a particular difficult and a difficult thing. And while we're going to be funding Murdoch, we're also going to be funding the alternatives to Murdoch. And the, the, the traditional news agencies were the ones that were best able to keep corporate monopolies uh, like the other uh, news media organisations into account. It was print news media that broke the fact that, you know, uh, Rupert Murdoch and, and the Daily Mail were doing illegal things like phone tapping. So we think that by giving to all of them, they can keep each other in check. Yes. What's special about printing things? What characteristics does Slate and the Huffington Post not have that the New York Times does? Uh, look, 
We think that those are new, those news organisations are admirable, but they're admirable because they like copy many of the features of, of newspapers. That they pay for like journalists in, in a long form basis. They pay for like in, in, investigative investigative journalists. But the problem is, the problem is that those things aren't going to survive either if they suffer the same fate, where they just get like copied repeatedly and uh, where they get copied endlessly and they can't protect their intellectual uh, property because they're just taking the facts from those articles and giving uh, the news to people without them getting credit for the work that they. I've done in finding those things. Last thing I wanted to look at in rebuttal is about what this does uh, for politicisation. And we heard that it's going to be, you know, difficult to openly criticise. It's going to be difficult to openly criticise the government. Well, the amount of money is, uh, that is given uh, to this independent body is not going to vary, and the government is not going to be able to determine who that money who that money goes to. So we don't think that people are, go are going to be worried about political favours. Like that. Then we heard that oh, there'll be politicisation because there'll be meeting editors between the PM and, and the editors. Look, everyone knows that editors meet the PM. The money doesn't the money doesn't really change that. What we do have under our system, though, is that there will be more sources of news information to then keep uh, those relationships between uh, like news barons and and politicians accountable. And you won't see a situation where it winnows away to just a few media barons like Rupert Murdoch, who then have a monopoly on opinion that people can't contradict and compete with that. Uh, yes? Why should the government decide for me which are the one or two major broadsheets in my city that I should listen to? Okay, we said that we're going to fund several papers. We're going to fund lots of papers. We think that if a paper, if this insurgent newspaper does exist, if they do start capturing an audience, we're going to fund that too. The problem in this debate is that that is not happening. That is something that you have to, that is something you have to respond to. Two arguments. Firstly, what this does for cross-media ownership. Secondly, the trivialization of news. Firstly, cross-media ownership. What we see under the status quo is where the business model of print journalism has become so difficult because the they classified ads aren't, in their, uh, aren't making much money anymore, because information is just being ripped off by news blogs. What we see is it's only profitable for a few companies to release news media. And they're not winning their place in the market because they have better quality news. They're winning their place in the market because of economies of scale, because they're already the biggest papers. We say that that is a problem in today's debate because this means that there are going to be fewer perspectives and fewer media owners. What we do by giving away money somewhat indiscriminately to people that publish newspapers, as has already been pointed out, is guarantee a more diverse uh, a, more, a more diverse media because you don't have to have already be running five, ten other newspapers and also radio and TV in order to be able to profitably make newspapers because we are turning the marginal unprofitable newspapers into viable businesses. There will be more opinions and people will get countervailing opinions. Second argument on the trivialisation of news. We say the kinds of things that will thrive under their model are the less socially useful forms of news. You know, Posh and Bex, Page Three Girls and in Australia, apocryphal crocodile attacks. What do we think is the harm then when that when news becomes trivialised and when it becomes like fused between news and entertainment? First thing we say this has a harm to agenda setting in that it takes up time that could be spent on more important issues when people talk about Obama's birth certificate rather than like assassinating US citizens in the war on terror. And secondly, it's going to mean that people trust what they read uh, less because there'll be a, a worrying fusion of news and entertainment, or they might just take it on face and lose their critical faculties. So because we think that this is a model that guarantees insightful, long-form journalism, but also that guarantees a diversity of media ownership, we propose. This house thanks the speaker and now welcomes the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, the issue in today's debate is that we are, as Shang Wu tells you, at a fundamental moment of transition in the journalistic world. There is a finite amount of information that people are willing to consume. They're only willing to invest a certain amount of time combing the internet, reading papers, choosing how they consume media. That choice and what people do, their lifestyle preferences in that regard, is in a moment of flux. The question is, should we force individuals towards a certain kind of consumption, 
or should we allow the preferences of individuals to reshape the news media market in a way that will allow the best information as determined by those who consume it to reach them in the most effective ways? Because know this, when a closing opposition and closing government ask the point of information saying this is a comparative debate, it absolutely is. Every dollar that you spend funding a dead industry that people don't want to read forces information into the market that crowds out and disincentivizes other creative forms of information from developing. So guys, although you have professionals writing blogs in the status quo, if you make those less attractive by flooding the market with other information that people don't want to read, you disincentivize those other forms of creative media that ultimately undermine the evolution of media production and consumption. We think that governments are not at all positioned to know that this is going to be in the best long-term interest of society, and we certainly think opening government has failed to convincingly demonstrate that this is going to be in the best long-term interest of society. I want to talk a little more in rebuttal before getting to my substantive uh, analysis as to why voters and individuals should be the ones to decide what information is and isn't good for them and isn't, isn't good for their democracy. But first, let's talk about how exactly their model is going to play out. Because I know you guys didn't want to be committed to how many newspapers you were funding in each market, but you needed to give us more than one to two, several, and lots within the span of a minute. And here's why. Because how you decide how many to fund determines the process by which this, this money is going to be allocated. If it's just a couple of papers, then you are funding entrenched journalism. In fact, while you started your speech with, we have respect for the oldest, most respected journalistic institutions. That sounds an awful like you want these government bodies to just be funding Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch is doing fine on his own. We don't think we need more government money to fund him. More importantly, the best and most successful news organizations are also doing fine on their own. See the success of the New York Times' paywall, prices that they've just increased under the fact that they're, they've had a successful implementation of a paywall, and that for certain kinds of journalism, there will continue to be a willingness to pay. We don't need to subsidize it via the government. But if they're not just going to fund these more entrenched forms of news that are doing fine on their own, no thank you, then we think that what they're going to do is just try and fund everything. And either that has to include funding xenophobes, bigots, increasing the volume of Rush Limbaugh's voice. And if there's one thing I hope we can agree on in this round, is that Rush Limbaugh does not need a bigger microphone or a bigger mouth. I think he has plenty of both. But moreover, what we would say is that if they're not just going to indiscriminately fund all hate speech that shows up before these boards, there needs to be a mechanism for deciding how that money is going to be allocated. They have consistently refused to engage with our analysis about what kind of mechanism would exist, because any mechanism that exists presumes that the government knows what does and doesn't constitute good media, and there are political implications that newspapers will then cater to in order to appeal to the government board standards. Paul. Bad journalism like Rush Limbaugh is going to exist under either case. At least under our model, there are countervailing viewpoints that contain facts that are you know, difficult and expensive to gather yep. that will drown out right. that nonsense. Because when Rush Limbaugh criticized a, a law student, there weren't countervailing facts and interests in the media right now to utterly silence him. We think that, first of all, if you make Rush Limbaugh louder, that paradoxically increases his voice. But we think there is plenty of counter-information in the media right now that is successful at getting out there. And much more importantly, just because we don't think that newspapers are as successful as they used to be, doesn't mean we shouldn't let this period of transition play itself okay. out to then see what becomes the most successful form of news media. The evolution of things like the New York Times paywall shows that it takes time to adjust, but that we are ultimately Mike. getting there. No, thank you. The next thing that I want to talk about is this idea of like what kind of information is going to be out there and what kind of information survives. We think that things like the Huffington Post have shown to be profitable and that a lot of online journalism will continue to be successful. But more importantly, when they talk about like the fact that trivial information is what gets out there because it's profitable, and I'll take you in a moment, guess what guys? You don't eliminate the profit motive when you subsidize these papers. All you do is give them money and still give them an incentive to continue to be profitable. So all of the incentives that exist in the status quo for putting out really crap information continue to exist. What doesn't exist? Incentives to innovate in the form of blogs and other new media like professionals commenting on their, their discipline because they know their voices will be crowded out by a more successful and more heavily subsidized form of government-sponsored media. Nick. Okay, so on the issue of Rush Limbaugh, you didn't give an argument, you made a joke. Can you give us a warranted argument as to what media is good and what media is bad? 
I'm telling you that there isn't a distinction. Uh, we don't have a definition of what media is good is ba and bad. I'm saying that when you choose to fund media, you definitionally are making a choice about what media is good and what media is bad. By putting your money into particular media organizations, your side of the house is the one that is forced to make that distinction. I would have loved it if opening government could have given us a distinction. Maybe you'll be able to in your speech. I now want to talk about what information we think is and isn't important for voters and democracy and why we think that it should be up to them to decide. We think that a fundamental view of democracy suggests that individuals have the right to determine on what basis they make their votes, on what basis they engage in the political sphere, what discourse they want to be exposed to, and what discourse they want to offer on their own. We think, then, that individuals as consumers, with how they spend their time, where they click their mouse, and what newspapers they choose to buy, are the individuals that are best positioned to understand what ultimately is in their interest. You guys may not like the fact that not everybody wants to consume a bunch of, inform like a bunch of really detailed information information about microeconomic policy in Lithuania, but that's because individuals have chosen that that's not as important to their lives and their conception of the good. We think that when the government steps in and prioritizes one form of media over the other, then it is undermining the legitimacy of an individual's market choice. But much more importantly, even if you buy their conception of what is and isn't good news media, Look at the popularity of things like Twitter covering Iran during the Green Revolution, of iPhone videos in the course of Syria and the uprising there. We think that individuals have directed their attention to what we possibly think of as good media. We're just looking for a market monetization for it. We think that the fact that those are slowly emerging isn't a reason to slow the emergence of successful monetization of new forms of media that have been more successful in investigative journalism. It's telling that they don't engage with Sheng Wu's analysis about how the perception of government funding slants individuals' willingness to consume media. See, for instance, the fact that the existence of NPR, of the BBC, and of PBS all make conservatives less likely to trust the information that comes to them. If they fund a select number of papers, then there is going to be massive mistrust of those papers. And if they fund everything, then there is going to be a general distrust of information put out by the government because, hey, these guys will fund anything. Either way, you're getting less effective information and you're stifling the emergence of important forms of discourse that are necessary for our democracy and our future, we oppose. I thank that speaker for his remarks, and this house now very pleased to welcome the member of government to continue our debate. You know, until Mike's speech, I, uh, I never realized that the people who were using Twitter during the Green Revolution in Iran were doing so so they could eventually monetize that, uh, that Twitter stream. And, uh, you know, otherwise they really would not have gone to the effort. But in all seriousness, Nick and I think that at least as much as there ought to be concern about people's access to newspapers in the status quo, there ought to be serious concern about the content of those newspapers. So in our extension, what we're going to tell you about are the pernicious effects on the status quo on newspaper content, newspaper bias, and why we stop this to a large extent when we subsidize newspapers. Then I'm going to go on and deal with three points of rebuttal that don't fit under this. I'm going to look at, does this undermine media evolution, and is media evolution a good thing? Secondly, is there likely to be a funding bias of this program that's been set up by opening government? And finally, do we think that the status quo is acceptable, or at least comparatively preferable, when we compare it to what admittedly might have some flaws in the system that government is proposing? So the first thing I want to look at is our first piece of extension. Why is we think subsidies provide an incentive for newspapers to cater to readers, instead of in the status quo where we think they fundamentally cater to corporate interests and advertisers. So recognize that in the status quo, Newspaper sales alone are not enough to fund a profitable newspaper. Accordingly, these papers turn to advertisers as a primary source of revenue. We think that's okay generally, but when it is a primary source of revenue, it is problematic for a number of reasons. Firstly, we think being dependent on advertisement provides incredibly perverse incentives for news coverage. Firstly, we think it makes there be an incentive to be generally pro-business in order to maintain more advertisement, but also it tends to be, there tends to be an incentive to be pro-particular interests, pro-particular businesses, pro-particular advocacy, which is not something we think we want in unbiased media. But moreover, we think it means that newspapers target specific constituencies. They target wealthier consumers with more disposable income for high margin products who are the people who advertisers pay them to put the ads in that newspaper. No thank you. 
This means we get biased coverage, significantly advantaging certain people and certain consumers. And moreover, we think it means that there are significant holes in that coverage, so people, particularly those who aren't attractive people to, rev to advertise to, people who are generally maybe uh, you know, sort of ostracized to some extent by the capitalist system, point of information, it means that these people are often cut, up, cut off from essential information that we think is really important for them to make political and other decisions in their lives. No, thank you. We think, like, you know, there's not a huge advertising market necessarily for a local newspaper in Topeka, Kansas. That doesn't mean that we don't think it's really, really important that that news gets out. So how do we change that on our side of the house? Well, we think under our model, we, uh, we weren't entirely clear, but we assume that the subsidy is going to be on a number of bases. We think it could be on the basis of something like, say, a subsidy per copy sold. It could be on the basis of readership. Right, information. And accordingly, we think what that means is there's a law, strong incentive to make it important to appeal to as many readers as possible if you want to increase the subsidy that you're getting from the government and getting from this board. Moreover, we think it means that all readers are equally valuable under this metric, as opposed to some, those who are just more profitable to advertise to, being more valuable to others. I think this reduces both the bias and the slant and the holes in news media coverage at the moment. We think that's essential for having an unbiased news media that actually allows all people to access their rights and access the ability to have information from which they can make decisions in their life. No thank you, Shenyu. But the second thing that I want to talk about in the extension, and Paul's already talked about media homogenization, but I want to talk about why the current business model of newspapers leads to a strong politicization of the news. We think even if they can show that there is some politicization on our side of us, we think it's substantially worse on theirs, and I'm going to explain why. So currently, as everyone agrees, the traditional print news business model is dying. It's not working. It's not profitable. So what does this mean is happening? Well, as Paul has said, and in addition to my prior point, small papers are increasingly being bought up by news barons like Rupert Murdoch because the economies of scale they can have by just reproducing the same content and having the exact same view in newspaper after newspaper after newspaper targeted at slightly different audiences. The problem with this is not just that the view is the same, that there's not variety in news, but also that it is politically biased. This is true for a number of reasons. Firstly, we think some barons just have like personal biases and personal incentives, and I think Rupert Murdoch is a perfect example of that, I'll take you in one moment. But moreover, we think large news media corporations are corporations, and they have the corporate interests of their shareholders at heart, which means they want things like lower taxes, more right-wing policy, right-wing like, uh, sorry, like right -wing economic policy, which we think leads to serious biases when you allow these cor corporations to buy up large numbers of news outlets, but I'll take you. Are you going to deny funding to news organizations that your shadowy committee decides are politically biased? Or can Rupert Murdoch still have lots of newspapers which you're now all giving money to? So I think he can, but I don't think other newspapers are forced into being bought by him because they can make profit in other ways because they have a subsidy. Right now, there is no alternative, no matter how committed you are to your journalistic values, but to be bought up by a corporation because otherwise your company will die. We make it so that that is not the case, and we think that is a huge improvement over the status quo. So look at the examples like GE buying out NBC. We think they're incredibly perverse situations because what? NBC wasn't actually making that much money, but GE buys it because it's a good platform for advocating for certain views. We think that kind of bias is incredibly pernicious. And on our side of the house, we firstly allow variety to exist because you don't have to be bought up by one of these corporations to make a profit. But moreover, we think we also give news corporations incentives to not only support neoliberal economic policies because they are also benefiting from the corporate, we sorry, from the welfare state and from taxation because they are being funded in some sense by government taxation. So they have incentives on both sides of the political spectrum. And that way, we think we undermine the kind of bias that exists in the status quo. We think that's very, very important. No, thank you. But with that said, I want to get on to three points of rebuttal. Firstly, does this undermine media evolution? So the first thing I want to ask is, Shang just kind of turned is, is this media evolution necessarily good? We think it's good that there are some new forms of media, but we don't think it's good if that means that newspapers die. They keep asking, what's special about print? What's special about print? We think one of the most important things about print is its ability to cover very, very small media markets, but more the fact that many people can access it, whether or not they have a computer, whether or not they regularly watch television, we think it's much, much easier for a wide variety of people to have access to print news media as opposed to the other forms of media that they are advocating for. We don't think you can rely on bloggers, moreover, to get the same kind of extensive coverage that news media provides simply because the cost is not feasible for those bloggers. But moreover, we think it's a case that we don't fundamentally undermine new media, we simply maintain newspapers as an alternative. We think the fact of the matter is that most new media isn't necessarily monetized and doesn't necessarily have a clear business model for being monetized. People do it because they want to provide news and want to get their opinion out there, not because they necessarily want to make money. Accordingly, we don't think we stop this evolution anyways. But the second question is, look, do we think there's likely to be funding biases? 
Well, firstly, we think it would be an incredible political controversy if it was shown that there was a huge bias in the slant in which, the, in which funding was provided to newspapers. On the other hand, because Rupert Murdoch isn't coming up for election, and because he has somewhat of a monopolistic per, uh, position in the status quo, he can be as biased as he wants with no repercussions. We think there is more control on our status House because at least it's controlled by the democratic will and not purely by corporate interests. Accordingly, even though there may be bias on, more, on both sides, we think it's much less on our side, and for all these reasons, we're very, very proud to propose. Yeah. House, thanks to that speaker very much for those remarks, and welcome to the member of the opposition to continue the case for the opposition bench. The small number of you in this room who, who know me well will know that uh, I was educated at quite a posh London school. It was, it was expensive to go to, and many people have gone on to hold important positions in British society. And in history class, I used to sit next to a photo. And, and two names in particular were striking about that class photo. They were the names of James Harding, the current editor of The Times, who most of you probably won't have heard of, and George Osborne, who's the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who many more of you probably will have heard of. The fact is that the vast majority of print media that these guys stand to defend is overwhelmingly establishment, it is male, and it is upper middle class, and this is a policy which uses the state's funds to hold back the march of history towards the growth of subaltern media that will create more diverse voices and get more important issues out for women, for sexual minorities, for racial minorities, and will globalise and democratise our media. Two points in extension. Firstly, subaltern media. Secondly, building a bit on democracy and government control and how sub subsidy affects that. No thanks. Before I do that, a couple of points of rebuttal. So firstly, they say it's a big problem that at the moment Politicisation is caused by the fact that the only viable business model you have uh, is to be bought up by a big, a big news empire if you're serious about your journalistic values. I, don't, I just don't really think that's true. It, it, I think you can turn to new media. Um, I think that's what we've been talking about all the way down the opposition bench. It was in no sense substantiated why that was true. I know that like, the Murdoch press is much less powerful than it used to be, but moreover, it is a, like, opening gov said they wanted to subsidise the big papers, right? So all of this stuff about, like, I, I presume if you're picking one or two big papers in most major cities, these will be papers that are currently established. It is not clear, therefore, that you get rid of the corporate or politicised interests that are already there. You just support those interests with state funding, and for closing to try and run away from that is a massive knife. What do we next hear? Um, we hear that evolution of news media um, is good to some extent. We think print's really valuable because more people can access it. Hands up in the room if you don't have regular access to a computer. Awesome. The fact is that the internet is overwhelmingly more democratised than the ability to pay for print media. We think that it is incredibly likely over time, because new media forms like Twitter, like the Huffington Post, like Slate, are free, unlike the vast majority of print editions of papers, that these things will continue to be democratised further. No thanks. So, let's talk about subaltern media. Firstly, why do subsidies squeeze out small new media outlets? First point, advertising revenue. Advertising revenue is incredibly important to things which operate solely on the internet. We think that this is reduced by the fact that these guys give an advantage to major papers by taking down their paywalls, but presumably allowing them to continue to advertise. But moreover, they reduce the marginal cost of established forms of media to people, right? We think it's generally true that people get their, their media from like maybe one or two major sources. What these guys do is disadvantage the Huffington Post and Slate and Jezebel and The Advocate by re like reducing the marginal cost of the things that they are currently able to do better than by not having enormous, massive, unnecessary infrastructures. Why are the establishment papers that Gov seek to defend overwhelmingly establishment, overwhelmingly undiverse? 
First, because often there are professional locks on whether or not you can join these papers. You have in the US to basically have gone to an incredibly expensive graduate school to have a realistic chance of getting a good job at a major paper. Moreover, in London, or, or like often these are incredibly masculinist newsroom environments based around old boys clubs. In France, the major papers are controlled by the Grand Lecole. All of these things mean that these papers overwhelmingly don't represent a diversity of voices. Note that some of the major people doing the work against Rush Limbaugh when he was being particularly outrageous were news, like news websites like Jezebel. But moreover, what we would say is in general, the print media model is one on which people only read one paper. When they're using new media, though, they can draw from right. thousands of sources. I'll take you in one second, Paul. Because they have RSS feeds. Because things that they didn't want to read previously that didn't necessarily fit with their pre-existing biases get retweeted into their news feeds. That's incredibly valuable because we think more than encouraging people to read one paper, which they can roughly know what the biases of will be, even if there's some diversity, it forces them to confront preconceived opinions. Cut. Alternative media and print media have different comparative advantages. Advantages. So we think that people are going to be consuming both under our model. Why do you think that a marginal difference in advertising revenue for Jezebel is going to outweigh the massive benefit that we have to more news outlets right, because, to let because, people consume because, because, both? Well, we presume that there is a limited amount of time that people are willing to spend reading the news. You want them to spend more time reading the New York Times, that will mean they spend somewhat less time reading Jezebel. I think that's a really obvious consequence. So, secondly, let's talk about democracy and government control. The first thing we want to say is the fact that you run these things at long arm's length, that they are somewhat independent, does not mean that there is not a debate about these subsidies and the forms that they will take. In particular, the overall level of funding available to these papers will still be a live political issue. Note that you now make them dependent on that subsidy in such a way that they are going to be, it's going to be incredibly difficult for them to experience sudden cuts in it. We note that even the shining examples of state-funded media organisations that dom sites like the BBC or AFP in France often do show strong pro-government biases because they are worried about losing their funding. Look at the fact that the BBC didn't ask questions about the Blair government over the death of Dr David Kelly. Look at the fact that AFP didn't ask questions of Chirac and Sarkozy over Clearstream or report negatively on the way the French government behaved in Rwanda. All of those things are worsened under your model when the purse strings are now controlled by live politicians. But moreover, why is investigative journalism harmed under this model? It is false to say that the only people that can do factual reporting of the kind the opening government seems so keen on are established newsrooms. The fact is, actually, most papers now outsource that stuff to Reuters and the Associated Press. Having more media outlets is good for Reuters and the AP. There is nothing to stop the Huffington Post and Slate paying them to do that for them. In fact, they do. So it's simply not clear that newsrooms are decaying under this model. What will decay, though, is a number of small media organisations like Private Eye in Britain, which are subversive. They are niche. They are small. And they are at a dis competitive disadvantage here, in spite of the fact they are often the people that do the edgiest and most dangerous investigative journalism exactly because they are small and they are catering to a niche set of interests. When they are squeezed out, as I've already shown, investigative journalism gets less good. This is bad for a more diverse media. It is bad because it puts more media in the hands of the state. We're very proud to oppose. <laughs> I thank that speaker very much for his remarks, and this House is now very pleased to welcome the final speaker on the government bench, the government whip. Sir Bot, I feel like I'm on American Idol or something. Uh, okay. Uh, so, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to do uh, two things for you, make this debate very simple. I'm going to talk about quality of information and quantity of information. And I think that it'll be sufficient to show you uh, why we think that we're winning this debate. And I think that an issue that's largely been ignored on their side of the House that we brought you very clearly, we agree that with first proposition that the role of the media is, uh, is to make sure that voters are informed in a democracy. So they had to tell us why people who have a hard time accessing the internet, why local communities who rely on local specific newspapers are less of citizens that have a right to this type of information to vote in a democracy than everybody else. 
why the, the, the entire extension of, uh, of, of second opposition was right now the news media is really biased in the status quo. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think that the cause of that bias was what Ben and I brought you. The fact that they only cater to certain readers more than other readers. The fact that like advertisers, for example, like Ben brought you a lot of analysis about how advertisers uh, uh, cater to usually upper uh, upper class, like uh, 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 people who are going to be able to have disposable income to buy their products, and accordingly, these newspapers they only report about these types of issues. This is exactly the cause of all of the problems they outline for you. So, on the quality of information, the first thing that we have to recognize is that there is no alternative for these newspapers. Recognize that they must sell themselves to corporations in order to continue to exist at all. So these arguments that we've gotten, I think, are like largely mitigatory. They're like, well, right, Rupert Murdoch is going to be funded on your side of the house. It's like, well, right now, he's just buying up everything. We think we get comparatively more views. It's probably better to have a countervailing view than just having one Rupert Murdoch view, because you can literally buy all the small newspapers as well. Go for it. If your concern is local news outlets being bought up by corporations, and how is giving more money to one to two corporate entities in, quote, major cities going to prevent the buyout of small local newspapers in rural communities? Because you make sure that these local newspapers don't have to sell themselves to these corporations in order to continue to exist. I do think it's the case that there might be, uh, it's possible that like some local newspapers like actually do want to do a good job of reporting, that they actually can do a good job of reporting, but there's no other way for them to exist but, uh, but to sell themselves. So at least you take away that incentive. And even if it doesn't happen in every single case, we're like, here's how comparatively better off in the status quo where everyone has to do this. So I think that we get more information uh, and, uh, or we get better quality information on our side of the house. Uh, then uh, uh, the other thing I want to talk about real quick, though, is sort of like the di diversifying uh, uh, media. Because we get this like absurd argument that like, People are going to stop reading Jezebel to go read the New York Times. Like, I don't know if you like you guys have like read the two. Like, pretty different. Uh, I think that like and not like substitutable uh, outlets of information. Like, that was a very uh, 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 no uh, yeah. See, even these guys agree. Like, that was ridiculous. Like, like I obviously I do think that like the, 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 the new media does have a very specific role. Also, it's already been sort of introduced. I don't see it going away. I, I just think that there's like people are going to be able to choose now. Uh, 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 no, thank you. But people are going to be able to choose what they want to read. Also, I have a feeling that a lot of rural, poor communities don't spend a lot of time on Google or Jezebel to find, to read this type of information. The new media just simply isn't accessible, and that argument wasn't responded to. I think that's the most important thing in this debate. Sure. But the point is that people still conceive of both of those things as reading news, and there's a limited amount of time they're going to allocate to that. Even if they're not perfectly substitutable because they're not the same, we agree, they may still be substituted at the margins. I, I am willing to bite the harm that the Gawker Network will have a few less readers if we can provide any news coverage to local communities to allow them to, to participate in a democracy. I'm sorry, I just think this extension is absurd. Uh, but, 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 but also, it's just like, I don't think that uh, I, th this, last infor this last thing that they, they, they have is like, well, there's this bias in government because the government isn't going to, uh, you know, they're not going there's going to be political incentives to not be with the government. So one, I think Ben gave you a good, uh, a good analysis, which is like, I think it, any government that's sort of like caught, like sort of cutting funding because of like uh, uh, political or like you know political criticism from newspapers uh, is likely going to be uh, wrapped up in scandal. That's probably not advantageous, given that there are like elections that take place and people probably don't want to seem like they're suppressing this type of speech. But also, I think that like the system that's been set up is perfectly reasonable because there are some clear metrics like readership, etc., to decide like uh, to, to, to decide what, like like what's worthy of funding, not just looking at like uh, no no thanks. Uh, not just looking uh, at what they claim, which is like the government isn't going to want to be criticized. I think also it's independent, so I just think that that, uh, that argument doesn't hold much weight. Uh, so the last thing that I want to talk about, though, uh, is sort of the uh, information uh, quantity that we get on our side of the house. Before I go on, I'll take Shango. If your sole metric is readership, then each city will get two tabloids. If your metric isn't readership, then your shadowy committee decides what kind of reporting is good and what kind is bad. Okay. I said things like readership. Like I, we, we weren't opening up. Like I said things like readership, though. Like sorry, like we, we weren't. But like like readership or other metrics, like uh, you could do it on like a pro, like a like Ben suggested, like a per copy sold basis. Uh, also, you can make sure that you're not funding like tabloids. You could also like 
fund like actual newspapers. You, I think reasonable people can tell the difference between the, like the New York Post and the New York Times. Like I don't think that's going to be hard for government people to do. I think sometimes like debaters put too little faith in bureaucracy. Sometimes it works. Uh, and I think that like you know we can defend that on our side of the house. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. The, the last thing that I want to talk about though is like we, we get this absurd claim in the last speech about access that like. The internet is more democratized. So I just don't think this is true. I think uh, one, like the way that Google works is usually about advertising. You can actually like, I know, like not a lot of people who are working three jobs and like, uh, uh, like you know, like lower class uh, citizens of society have the time to really like scour Google in order to like figure out what news outlet is right for them. And I think oftentimes they are just led to these new media establishments, which by the way, I don't think are any better than the media establishments that we've been criticizing already. I don't think it should just be the Huffington Post and that's it. And I think that oftentimes you're making sure that you're establishing these types of uh, these types of new media outlets, which is a problem, but also just in general about access. I do think it's the case that oftentimes there are people that like literally just don't know how to use the internet. I know we're all college students, we're all like young, we're able to like, like, you know, use the internet, you can navigate technology. Like, I, I literally had to spend an hour to teaching my grandmother to turn on the computer. Uh, there are also just some rural communities that like don't get internet connection. Maybe that only exists in the U.S., but it's a substantial portion like uh, of the population. Yeah, yeah, it's really big. Doug. It's like really, yeah, it, it's bad. Uh, so at that point in time, like literally, these people can be cut off if their newspapers aren't allowed. So, so there's a binary. Either these newspapers uh, aren't going to exist, uh, but also the content. I think. They haven't been talking about. They're like the Huffington Post can just replace it. Oftentimes, people want to read about the local content, what's happening in their city, and that requires to have a local newspaper focusing on local issues, which affect those people the most. And well, we're not only talking about like national elections; we're talking about local elections. And we get that better on our side of the house. We preserve the locality of newspapers. For these reasons, we're proud to propose. I thank that speaker very much for his remarks, and we are now very happy to welcome the final speaker of the debate, the opposition whip. Here, here. To be clear, Rush Limbaugh and Rupert Murdoch are in, they're on the board, but they won't be producing trash, but they will be independent of the state, and they will be selected by reasonable people. This is the prop of all things. It is the prop of everything will be okay, just trust us, right? We're governments and we're good at working out which news you need to have funding. No one was ever actually ever willing to be pinned down, because then they knew, as you know, Shane's point of information makes it perfectly obvious, the minute you are pinned down on this, there are obvious decisions that states are making, reasonable people are making, about what is and is not the things that citizens should or should not be consuming. I wonder what the gender of the reasonable people is. This massively undermines proposition claim that this has anything to do with democracy, and it massively undermines closing government's claim that big papers are the problem. There's no reason to believe that big papers will not be continued to be funded under this proposition, particularly, well, I suppose unless you misheard opening opposition saying big is small, right? That might have helped you out there, I suppose. It is not clear that the media that they are funding will inform. It is not clear that the media they're funding will contribute to a democratic debate. We refer you to the British media. It is not clear what the proposition is going to do to guarantee that they contribute to a democratic debate. It is not clear what they're going to do to require that these papers do investigative information rather than take the money and produce trash. It is not clear why the people that do do investigative reporting are not not worse off under their model because all of the companies that now have lower fixed costs can offer lower advertising rates, which means that private eyes in a worse financial position, which is how marginal cost works, guys. It is not clear that this revives any local journalism. It's simply not in the model, Ben, right? Like, you're not funding small papers, you're agnostic about the ownership of these papers, and it's reasonable to assume that the subsidies for the big papers makes it easier for them to crowd out the smaller ones. Uh, what? Uh, like, madness, madness, madness. It is also what is clear, however, one way or another, is that this does create an entrenched dependence upon the state, right? Let's get on to that right now. So, let's do question one, democracy, and let's do question two, quality of media and reasons otherwise to, not to do with democracy. So, no thanks. 
And what appears to agree it would be nice for the media to be independent of the government in order to be, you know, good at controlling the government, and that would be cool for democracy. What this model does, insofar as, as they say, it's going to be quite a lot of money, is enables a certain set of papers to expand a lot, based on the money that they're getting, which is government money. To that extent, there will be a set of people whose jobs depend on the money they're getting with the government. To the extent that they're not fixing for all time the absolute numbers that any particular paper is getting, every paper knows that that amount of money could go up or go down, which is why people well, who work in industries that are dependent on the state, like the BBC, like some of the French media, tend to be a little bit more careful. The other thing they absolutely ignored and tried to cop out of is the dependence of the government on papers. All Paul had was the rather pathetic and insipid answer to the effect that, of course, the sun being able to decide in British elections is bad. What he never responded to was the idea that once, now that we are finally getting rid of the power of Rupert Murdoch in Britain, thank God, like Australia's worst export, right? Um, possibly after the beer. Um, <laughs> you are using government money to entrench that predominant position within the British media market. To that extent, British Parliament governments are more dependent on those people, and that is bad for democracy. No answer. They said, ah, being beholden to the market is much, much worse. A couple of responses on this which weren't responded to either. We pointed out business was not monolithic, right? It is sufficient to produce a vast diversity of media outlets. In order for evidence for this, see the vast diversity of media outlets. We pointed out the papers can and do take on business. Look at the Daily Mail going after bankers. Look at, I don't know, left-wing press publications. We pointed out that these corporations stay private and you are picking winners from the current media establishment, well, which is to say the people that already have those very tight sociological links with the establishment media, which brings me on to those people that the print media establishments do not cater to. There is a sociology to Fleet Street, a sociology to American journalism, not responded to, but they are still read by the people otherwise uncatered to, right? They are still the people who well, could get a more demo democratic, a diverse, a more internationalist, a more cosmopolitan media are being crowded out because they're those outlets are harder to ex uh, those outlets find it harder to exist under your model, Paul. You said we were funding crap like Rush Limbaugh and News Corp. We were funding them all, good and bad, so that at least people had a choice between News Corp and better news. Oh, all? Oh, well, it was two in the first speech. What the hell are you talking about? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if that's true, it's still reasonable to assume that all of the things that you don't like, if we're literally funding everything, then all of the things about tabloids being cheaper remains true, right? That, so that changes literally nothing, except that you are all now paying for it whether you like it or not. That's insane. So, one more about this. The new media of the marginalised are screwed. Why is that true? Because there is a fixed amount of media people consume. Because newspaper companies, no thank you, are now going to be able to lower marginal costs like things like avenue revenue, av uh, advertising revenue. That is bad for the Huffington Post. That is bad for Slate. And yes, it is even bad for Jezebel because some feminist women do read the New York Times, believe it or not. So all that's left on democracy is this stuff about access to information. They ignored all the stuff Ben brought you about how they interact with the internet and information from new media being different. In 10 years, smartphones will be cheaper than a toilet paper, right? Like, they'll clearly be transparently cheaper than having a subscription to a newspaper, which is not that cheap, guys. But also, the filter effect, while still present with the internet, is different. Logging on gives you access to thousands upon thousands of news outlets, which is simply not true of a news agent, right? This is not something that requires scouring, guys. Get an RSS feed, log on to Twitter. Good God. Finally, <laughs> what you know to be true, that there are more media, that there are more viewpoints in the world right now than there have ever been at any point in human history. You know that to be true. You know that it is more diverse. You know that it is not true that all of these media are being brought up by Rupert Murdoch. In fact, Rupert Murdoch is going bankrupt. Hurrah. Um, you know that these things continue to exist, that it is more diverse, that reporting and investigation continues, done by new media, but also done by news bureaus, which now cater to a diversity of news outlets rather than being beholden to Murdoch. Do the new media piggyback, because that's the only answer they had on the quality of information. Firstly, it is simply not true. Shane gave you some examples, we gave you a few more, right? You know, I think we won that one. In many cases, we pointed out that it is mutually beneficial between new media and those print media that have survived, but no longer have preponderant media power which allows them to destroy democracy. So what is left? What is left is that maybe, just about, there will be some reason to take all of your money, well, 
huge amounts of your money and throw it at every single media outlet in the hope that somewhere at the margin one investigation or two investigations might not take place. Is there really any reason to believe that that marginal increase in investigation is worth throwing money at every paper on the planet? That's nonsense. Thank you very, very much, guys.